Hey everyone, I'm Mark Hennick. This is So Called Normal. Today on the show, we have Kimberly Moffat, YouTuber, psychotherapist, uh, relationship expert. We talk a lot about relationships, and, you know, Valentine's Day is, is coming up, so happy Valentine's Day. Don't forget. You know, I'm, I'm someone with, I have depression, yes, but I also have social anxiety disorder, and I've noticed time and time again in, in my relationships how my social anxiety can interfere with that and how it makes me want to uh, retreat into myself and not engage with people, and, and that's difficult because it turns out relationships are a two-way street. You got to give and you have to take. So I think you'll really enjoy the conversation that we had. Uh, without further ado, here's my Valentine's Day conversation uh, with Kimberly Moffat. My name is Kimberly Moffat, and I, at the moment, am a YouTuber. <laughs> um, but I've had a really unconventional history in the in the world of relationships and in mental health and in therapy. So my history is that I have a doctoral degree in clinical and counseling psychology, but I'm not a licensed psychologist because I have this YouTube channel and I'm having a lot of fun with it. And it's it's um, geared specifically towards relationships. Right. And so um, there were some rules with the College of Psychologists about not being able to like work with brands. Oh, really? Yeah. I didn't know about this. This is really interesting. So why? Because is, is it is it why? I don't so even I don't even know why that would our be. Our colleges in Canada are very strict. So sure. if you live in the States and you're like, I want to support Sensodyne, you can do that. But here in Canada, we're not really allowed to put our name or face behind a brand because it would be seen as a conflict of interest as a government regulated health professional. Interesting. So I had to make a decision when I finished my 14 years of university. I had to make a decision <sighs> on whether or not I would get licensed. And ultimately, I was having so much fun with my channel and sure. so much fun with speaking and doing some really creative things that I loved. So ultimately, I decided not to get licensed, which well, was a really big decision. That doesn't yeah. rule it out, though. I mean, you're you're always going to be a. Well, so I guess you can't call yourself a psychologist. Exactly. Then? Right. Yeah. Okay. So uh, actually, you know what? In many ways, a, 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 a PhD in psychology, you get to just trot that out every time. Now, Absolutely. You, can, you can't just, <laughs> just sum it up as psychologist. <laughs> yeah. Right? Exactly. Um, so so then, what does what does being a YouTuber give you that being a psychologist wouldn't? Well. I Actually, I still own the clinics that I started sure. 10 years ago. So we actually have four locations in Toronto oh, yeah. now. We have one at Young and Eglinton, yeah. uh, King West, Liberty Village, and in Yorkville as well. That's our latest one. Yeah. And so I started that. And I love growing businesses. I really mm -hmm. like to be creative and, and grow them. So we have about 25 employees now nice. for those clinics. Um, but on YouTube, I really like, so I started actually about four years ago after I had my daughter. And I made little relationship videos in my office, kind of not really knowing, you know, what where it would take me or what mm -hmm. it would do. But I was just giving advice. And pretty quickly, I realized my audience was like all young women between right. 13 and 25. And I, I was not expecting that at all. So I kept making videos for that audience. And the channel really took off um, within a period of a few months, I'd and say. And you're up to how many subscribers now? I'm almost 700,000 yeah, now. that's huge. Congratulations. So thank you. Yeah, it was not expected at all. And so, um, but the cool thing is YouTube allows you so much creative freedom mm. and so much expression. And so, um, and such a mass audience where you can really touch so many people with the same amount of work as maybe you'd be seeing, you know, a week's worth of clients sure. at, a, at an yeah, office. Yeah. And so um, so that's what I kind of dedicate myself now part time to as well yeah. is my YouTube channel yeah. called Ask Kimberly. Ask Kimberly. So I noticed that as well, that you have a very um, active uh, listener base <laughs> of, of young women <laughs> yes. uh, who really invest a lot in, in, in what you're talking about and the types of issues that they're navigating. So what are some of the more common requests that you get from from people and, and that, that you talk about on your on your channel. Yeah, well, I think nowadays growing up as a girl is really tough. And it was like that when I was growing up as well. And I picture myself as like a teenage girl, maybe 13 or 14, um, really nerdy, kind of quiet, mm -hmm. not really having like the skills or the empower, kind of empowering advice to be able to like talk to people or I know that sounds kind of funny, but um, it's just a very awkward age. Yeah, and sure. at that age, your relationships are basically everything. You know, right. you it's your friends and your relationship with your parents and having a crush and all of those things can kind of feel like the ultimate high or the ultimate mm -hmm. low. Mm -hmm. And I really think 
point, that's um, the majority of my subscribers are really in that place. They find yeah. the channel because they're looking for advice. And so some of the main questions are really, you know, how do I read someone's body language? How can I talk to someone in a way that expresses how I feel? Mm. How can I tell if someone likes me? Um, and those are some of the, the kind of core videos of the channel. And I try to deliver that advice in a way that's um, not the, ty- the type of thing that I would have read in a 17 magazine right. growing up, because that's all I had um, right. to kind of base my inf- uh, decisions on as a teen. So um, it's a little bit more heartfelt. And I think um, coming from me, somebody who has been there before mm-hmm. and, um, and actually really cares about the outcome or cares about their confidence, um, for me, it's a, something really special that I get to do. Yeah. Well, and you can speak in, in a language that connects with them as well. And it's probably, I think, because you, you were doing that either before or, or with because becoming a PhD level psychologist or no, sorry, PhD (laughs) level therapist. There we go. Okay. Um, You haven't changed in that respect. You haven't turned into the doctor or, or, you know, the professional. You can still speak using that, that target language, right? Yeah, definitely. I think that, I mean, even the professional kind of language wouldn't really work on YouTube, right. to be honest, either. I don't use my doctor title just because I think it's, um, you know, on YouTube, it's really about connecting with your audience mm-hmm. and talking about things they want to hear, but not in a patronizing way. Well, and it's a barrier so, right away. I mean, it, yeah. it puts you above, even if even if you don't act that way, it, it creates the separation. A hundred percent. And so, um, so it's kind of like a bit of a big sister role, which sure. I really enjoy. I never had a big sister growing up. So, mm-hmm. and I always, I always wanted a big sister to get advice from and everything. So I had a big sister growing up, but she wasn't as bubbly and uh, <laughs> as you. She, she went through a, a, a glam grunge phase in the '90s. Sometimes, oh, that's the, fun. yeah, that's yeah, fun. yeah, yeah, yeah. It, I, I will not let her forget it uh, or the pictures. Oh my goodness, that's funny. We all have pictures we want to erase from that that's, time that's period. That's true. That's true. <laughs> um, so, um, you, where did you grow up then? In Toronto? I grew or? up in Guelph, Ontario. In Guelph. Mm-hmm. And um, I actually did my undergrad degree there as well Mm -hmm. in music. Um, Then I went to Laurier to study music therapy as my master. So that's kind of how I got into the counseling aspect of things. So music therapy. What drew you to music therapy? Well, actually, um, this is going to sound really funny, but I didn't really know a lot about music therapy when I got into the program. Mm -hmm. Um, I knew that I wanted to help people. I knew that I wasn't quite finished my education and I had the credentials from kind of both psychology and music to get into the program. So I was like, it just worked. I know. And they would accept four students a year, but it's like really specific criteria. And I was like, okay, okay, like I feel like I want to do my master's. I'm really interested. But at the time, I didn't know a lot about it. And so I learned over the next two years, but I I ultimately felt like it wasn't the right career choice for Mm -hmm. me but that it led me somewhere really good, which was psychotherapy and counseling. So Interesting, yeah. So so it doesn't sound like you were, you know, born wanting to be a music therapist and no. that's what you studied all your life. And, and some people it, really are. And it sure. was a, it's a wonderful career path sure. as well. So Absolutely is. So so actually, can you tell us a little bit about music therapy, what you learned in, in your master's and how that works? I don't think a lot of people actually really know a lot yeah. about it. Well, music therapy is a very effective form of therapy for many people, um, specifically certain types of clients. Um, mm-hmm. So I worked with children with autism, mm-hmm. um, but there's a, a lot of research kind of in geriatric populations as well. And um, and maybe, and I even worked at CAMH for a little while in the schizophrenia ward, mm. which was really interesting uh, because some of those patients have like a history of being in the music industry mm-hmm. um, and are quite creative. Mm-hmm. And so, um, so music therapy really is a way of um, helping someone express themselves in a non-intimidating environment. Mm-hmm. And then it can lead to talking and it can lead to other things. Um, and the research I did for my graduate thesis was actually um, with uh, adolescents in high school. Okay. So it was helping, because I have a bit of a pop music background, mm-hmm. um, we would sit down and write songs together and that's nice. considered music therapy and then we'd kind of interview all the students after they'd created these songs mm-hmm. and talk to them about what it meant for them yeah so are you a musician then yourself? I mean, you've studied music for a long time. Yeah. So I, I grew up as a musician. Um, I, I was a professional musician for a little while with the Drayton Festival Theater. Okay. What did you play? Um, I actually sing and I play the oh, piano. Sing. Okay, yes. great. great. So, but classical. And then <laughs> and then when I was 18, I got a, this is like a very funny path for me is, is that I actually... Um, was singing pop music for a few years as part of a trio, like a pop trio yeah. in Canada. And we did a lot of touring and we had a song on much music and that type of thing, nice. um, which really wasn't my space. It really wasn't my <laughs> world, but it was super fun. Sure. And I had a really great experience doing it. And that band was called Untamed. Untamed. So you still do you still perform at all, sing, have a reunion? 
I well, I don't perform with them, no. but now I just I just sing for fun, and sometimes I even sing on my channel. Like I'll do little yeah. parodies and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it's it's such a fun skill to have, and um, and I think music is really for me has been like a gateway to many mm. other things because it's so creative, and you can really. Um, I mean, therapy is so creative, too. Mm -hmm. So I think it, it, it's a nice mix of art and science. Yeah, when I was um, doing community work, I had a client briefly who had schizophrenia, and you mentioned working in the schizophrenia ward at a hospital. Uh, and we, But this was in a community setting. So we went to his apartment. Uh, it was a um, uh, supportive housing. Uh, and we walked in, and he, had, he was a painter. He had paintings five, six, wow. ten deep everywhere on every wall. Oh, my gosh. Just stacked. And they were really good. Wow. That's the thing. Like, I don't think of myself as, as a – I'm more of an art watcher than an expert, <laughs> but I can tell when, when is something is pretty good. Yeah. And, but it, I, I was struck by the fact that it was such a shame that the world – couldn't see this extraordinary art oh, that was wow. in this apartment, right? Oh my gosh. So now we see more and more people, whether it be music or art or dance or whatever, um, really having a platform to to share their gift. With oh others. my gosh! And yeah, I think even when you're going through something, like for me as a teen, when I would be going through a hard time, mm -hmm. I mean, the first thing I would do is go and write a song. And right. so, in a way, it's kind of you know whether or not you have a therapist for it, I think it's a really nice vehicle to kind of express yourself and get through whatever rough times yeah. you're yeah. going through. And sometimes that's not enough, but but it's, I think it's a nice way to, whether it's dance or music or art, kind of express yourself. So. Yeah. So you mentioned a couple of times, you know, working through stuff as a as a young person. Yeah. You know, what were you working on? The, oh the typical gosh. teenage stuff or, um, you know, did you did you encounter some adversity in your life? Gosh, that's a really deep question. That's what Mark. we're here for. Kim. Is, that what we're, is that what we're here for? Oh we, and we've, we've we've got our our typical fifty minute session. So now you're my therapist. We're oh my gosh. Um, but I am not a licensed psychologist, so I have to say that I think legally too. That's really funny. Um, well, I think I, in many ways, I was a really typical teenage girl. But I was I was insanely conscientious and very A-type. Um, mm. So if you can picture like a young Hermione Granger, like <laughs> that's basically me. Right. Um, so per perfectionist? Per super perfectionist. Yeah. And so for me, um, the, the issues that I encountered growing up were really uh, like in the realm of self-esteem, sure. eating and body image and things like that. I think that's really normal. Yeah. And so with a lot of my subscribers, we noticed that some of the thing, same things kind of come up and there's questions about that. So I have right. a few videos on that type of thing. Um, Were you the? Do you have siblings? Yeah, I have three younger brothers. Yeah. Three. Okay, I'm so you're the old. Oh yeah. yes. So you were you mom at any point? <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. But you know, my parents were very busy growing sure, up. They're, I had a sure. really loving family. I was really really lucky. Um, but I I did encounter a lot of life's um, events on my own. I had right. to figure things out kind of on my own, and I feel like I always needed. Um, I always felt like I needed someone to kind of help me along. And so I reached out to like older cousins mm -hmm. and things like that. And mm -hmm. even my dance teacher played a really big role in like helping me choose universities. Really? Yeah. yeah. So you, have, you found, uh, because you needed them, uh, functionally, role models and, and other yeah. people to help you. Yeah. Exactly. But I think that's kind of tied into like maybe why I feel the need to sure. do the work I do now. <laughs> because I'm like, I feel like yeah, growing up is tough and you don't always right. have someone to, I mean, it's not the same thing as sitting down with someone one on one, but right. feeling like you can have advice or someone to lean on is important. Sure. Well, and this is why I like exploring not only why people are doing what they're doing now, but what got them there. Yeah. I, I've never encountered anybody yet who's doing work that's completely unconnected oh, that they for just sure. parachuted into, right? Yeah. Even if though sometimes it can feel like that, that you don't know how you got to where you are. Yeah. But there's almost always a, a path. And absolutely. You know, I, I, I think I've had similar feelings of maybe not. Maybe you haven't had it to this extreme, but uh, if you want something, basically, if you want something done right, you have to do it yourself kind of thing. <laughs> you're just going to take control. You're going to do it uh, because that's what you had to do, right? Yeah, Growing absolutely. Up, you, you had to do it. Absolutely. So, so then how did you uh, make the jump from the master's degree into doing the PhD, into becoming a therapist and, and opening all, you know, a, a fleet of Gosh, clinics? Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, been long, it's been it, a it long has, journey. Yeah. Like you really went all in on this thing. I did. <laughs> 
<laughs> but you know, I think that the, I mean that's I mean it's a testament to how like when young people are like, I don't know what I want to do when I grow up. I'm kind of like, well, it doesn't really matter. You're gonna right. figure it out. Just and, do something. And, yeah, just do something. Yeah. And like I had no idea either, and and I figured it out, and and you, I kind of jump from thing to thing. But as long as you're following like where your heart is, I think that's the most important right. thing. Well, and so, so often people, this isn't just the young people. Certainly adults do it too. They get way lost out in all this stuff that may never happen. That mm-hmm. they don't know, and then they miss the moment, right? Yeah, absolutely. So I feel like there's no need to stress about the future. It's just about doing what your heart is in right now. Yeah. Um, although I need to take that advice more seriously myself sometimes. Really? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Those who can't do teach, as we, <laughs> as we say. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So I guess like after I finished my master's, I was I was um, kind of legally able to practice psychotherapy as a counselor, but I felt like I still needed more education right. in psychology. So I actually, um, funny enough, started my practice as a way to get hours for my doctorate because okay. I needed supervision here in Canada. That's, talk about type A, yeah. I, mean, I need supervision, so I'll just create a structure to supervise me. I did, I did and luckily I got approval for it because I'm not sure. Like, It was really funny. I, I, just, I didn't know that I would get approved for that, right. so I applied. And, and so basically I, I had this private practice, which I was seeing a few clients a week in, mm-hmm. and that's kind of the hour, some of the hours I was getting for school. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I realized I really loved marketing, and I really loved social media, and right. I loved doing media appearances. So that kind of that kind of stuff just built up, I guess, as a result of having this tiny mm-hmm. little practice. And within probably six months, I was completely full. And wow. I, at the time, <laughs> was reading a lot of Robert Kiyosaki, like mm-hmm. Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and a mm-hmm. lot of financial literature that I love. I'm really into finance. Mm. And so... Um, I, I was all about this passive income thing. Like I, I thought, sure. oh, that would be cool if my business could run and it could it could you go when I'm there. not there. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So I thought, and if I get sick or if I want to have kids, then I won't be able to see all these clients myself. I'll need a little bit of help. So I hired my first two associates, like within the first year of business, yeah. which was really soon. Sure. Uh, but they would see clients when I wasn't there. And we had a little answering service that was like answering the phone and they were booking appointments for these other therapists mm-hmm. when I wasn't in, in, in mm-hmm. the office. Mm-hmm. So pretty soon we were busy enough that we had to move to a bigger space wow. at Young and Eglinton. Yeah, yeah. So then, you know, I, I have a friend as well who, uh, she, her background is in social work, but she did something similar. She wanted to start up a clinic and mm-hmm. bring on associates. And she realized really quickly that her, she was educated as a social worker. Not, yeah. She didn't get an MBA, right? <laughs> exactly. she, was, she was never taught in social work school, like you don't learn in, in when you're doing a psychology degree, 100%. how to actually run a business. Yeah, it's, it's, it's something that nobody ever expects. But right. I think I even love business probably business is probably like my number one yeah. um, passion that sounds kind of funny because I'm passionate about a lot of things but uh, my dad was an entrepreneur and okay. and I've I've probably read like every entrepreneur entrepreneurial like important piece of entrepreneurial literature out there and my doctoral yeah. thesis actually focused on the psychology of entrepreneurs really oh yeah. that's interesting so in a nutshell <laughs> <laughs> what did you find out what did you learn about the psychology of entrepreneurs like you well entrepreneurs go through a really really tough phase right in the beginning between mm-hmm. years one through six if they don't give up they're still pretty stressed after year six but Jesus it takes six years <laughs> it can take even more than that I mean <laughs> I'm only like <laughs> two years in. Ten. come on <laughs> but it's yeah, it's really, I mean, the way I sum it up, you are learning about all of your issues in such a short period of time because right. you're you're forced to face them, right? Sure. You're doing every job and there's a lot of highs and lows. So you really have to be emotionally uh, mature and uh, be able to understand what emotions mm. you're going through because there's so much happening. You're dealing mm. with many people usually and personality types mm. and the thought of failure and finances and things that scare you. Mm-hmm. Um, and you have to do it all at once. And, right. and even the, the fear of kind of like providing for your family is there as well. That emotional maturity piece that you need, um, is it possible to become emotionally mature without being emotionally immature for a while and making a lot of mistakes <laughs> and figuring it out? And, you know, you hear like that, that's something that that I think people get so hard on themselves for their failures. Oh my gosh. And they don't realize that the people that you see out there really successful, oh, you're just not seeing all the failures. A thousand right? percent. I mean, every super successful entrepreneur I've ever met is someone who is extremely self-aware and has mm. probably gone through tons of failures and learned sure. from it. Uh, but that's the beauty of life, I think, is being able to throw yourself into situations where you really right. don't know anything and just be vulnerable and willing to learn. Yeah. And I think that's what makes that's what makes you mature emotionally. Well, and, and I think that's really what, what in, in my opinion, um, 
differentiates an entrepreneur, uh, somebody who has that growth mentality, that mm -hmm. when you have a failure, it's not, oh, great, another failure. This means that I'm worthless and I can't do it. It's just, OK, well, we know what doesn't work yeah, or, or at learned. least doesn't work this time. Yeah. And it can it can be devastating to have a sure, failure. Yeah. I mean, that's probably Well, it should really be. Normal. It means you care about it, I think. Yeah. <laughs> this is actually how I approach um, recovery and mental health as well, which mm -hmm. is, a, Interesting. you know, a, that's a, a big thing for me is this. Um, I feel like recovery orientation is a buzzword now, but mm. uh, this this radical idea of recovery, which is that every time you have a relapse, if you're struggling, even if you become suicidal or 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 you fall back into your eating disorder again or whatever it is, mm -hmm. every time I relapse in my depression, I think I know what this is. I've been here before. I know mm -hmm. how to get out of here again. I know how long it's going to last, probably give or take. I know it's going to suck, and yeah. I know I have to <laughs> let it suck, and that's okay. But I know I'll come out the other side. That's too, really right? and that's so positive. Having had that life experience to be able to say, yeah. I know what this is and I'm confident that I can make it through. Right. Um, but but I'm, I'm not sure that life experience alone does it. There seems to be there, there needs to be that shift. And this is probably what you help people do in therapy. Right. Is, absolutely. Is to try to change that mindset. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, although I'm not practicing anymore, right. I think it's. Um, yeah, it's definitely about a mindset shift. And, and I think f um, for some of my clients, it's even about accepting what it is. Like for, with something like anxiety, it's about not saying, okay, I'm never going to be anxious again. No. Yeah. <laughs> because you, please. You will be. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it's about saying, you know what, I'm having a panic attack or when I'm super right. anxious to be able to sit with it and say, you know, this is this is what I'm going to be going through for the next little yeah. while and I'm okay with it yeah. and and that's that's okay but as long as I have the tools to cope then yeah. I'll, I'll be all right I've even learned and this is where it becomes unhealthy <laughs> to, to use trauma and and some of the um, uh, collateral damage of trauma a dissociation uh, mm -hmm. to my benefit as well it's that oh, interesting. if you can step back and and dispassionately observe what's happening to you and think Oh, I'm having a panic attack right now. Look at that go. <laughs> then, I mean, that sounds really morbid, but it actually, actually can be quite helpful. Yeah, it's too. kind of like an out of body. Exactly. Yeah. So that's the, the symptom, right, is the out of body uh -huh. experience of dissociation. But then uh, if you can learn to use it, it's almost like lucid dreaming, I guess. You Gosh, well, I've never it. had that experience once. myself. But that's well, I've had cool. lucid dream. I've had lucid dreaming once. Have you ever had? Do you I do any not. dream stuff? Oh, that, no, I I'm don't. Gonna have a dream person. <laughs> that would be really interesting. I, it would. So, OK, n now we're going to get deep into psychology psychology nerd. <laughs> We're going to oh, geek gosh. out on psychology. Okay. <laughs> so favorite uh, type of or, or approach to psychotherapy? Oh, oh my gosh. Okay. So <laughs> this is really funny because I don't practice this anymore. Mm -hmm. But I, when I practiced, I absolutely loved something called ERP, which is exposure and response prevention. Okay. So my absolute favorite type of client ever to work with was actually OCD. Oh, interesting. Um, so like I've never experienced OCD myself sure. before, but I, I feel like that's the type of client that I connect the best with. Okay. So explain that approach a little bit deeper. So, so exposure and response prevention is essentially exposing somebody to the thing they're afraid of. Yeah. over um, a long period of time. So mm -hmm. it could be 10 sessions, 12 sessions, 16, depending on sure. what the issue is. And usually done for phobias, though, isn't it? And, and things like that? Yes. And so that was, that's, I mean, usually phobias are anxiety issues. Right. So they're connected. So usually people who have phobias also have OCD. Sure. Oh, interesting. I yeah. So, um, so usually it's about exposing that person to the thing that they're afraid of. And sure. so we do that in session or we can take them out into the field right. and do the thing that's so whether it's driving or dogs or spiders or th yeah. those types so of things. Now, and I hope listeners have to appreciate you're not just dumping a box of spiders on them oh, saying get over it. <laughs> that, no, that, no, 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 that's that not it's, how it works. it's graduated. Here. It's very, very gradual. Yeah. So, um, so, for example, I had a client that was very um, afraid of medical tests um, mm. and, you know, afraid of diseases like cancer and things mm -hmm. like that mm -hmm. and being diagnosed. And so he hadn't been to the doctor in like 10 years. Well, wow, because of that fear. Sure. If you don't go to the doctor, you can't get diagnosed, right? Exactly. <laughs> so it's a major problem for yeah, this, yeah, this yeah. guy. Sounds like my father. <laughs> <laughs> <Anyway>. <laughs> <laughs> but sure, it, yeah, it was incredible to see like how, how the therapy really helped him not just get over the phobia and be able to go to the doctor and get tested yeah. and all the stuff that he needed to do yeah. for the sake of his health. But then um, I, I think that once you kind of graduate from that ERP, it gives you the confidence to know that you can also over overcome other issues in your life as yeah. well. So since then, he's been able to kind of start a business and get married and oh, all the wow. things that he was, I mean, in, in terms of like contamination, he didn't want to have a partner because he didn't want to kiss them and, and right. potentially infect them and that 
type of thing. So, so it was really connected to all of the things that were going on in his life. Sure. And, um, and it's really cool to see how ERP can, can directly and, and quickly change someone's life. Did you ever have to dress up like a clown? I did not. No. <laughs> Well, because so there's a reason. Yeah, I was gonna say. So there's a reason that I ask because if somebody's afraid of clowns, right? That and. Can you imagine your therapist walks out? So there is actually an episode of Frasier. I have a a Frasier. No, I have a Frasier thing. It's it's a whole issue. We we can talk about that separately. (laughs) But uh, anyway, he he's a psychiatrist, and in session, he dresses up like a clown. Oh my! Well, that would be absolutely terrifying. I think it would be too. So a little bit of background about me: I paid the bills in college. College by dressing up as a clown and entertaining a children's did you really? birthday parties. I 100% did. I did not know yeah. that. Okay. And one of the, my favorite part about it, I think, was the ability to put on the face paint, the, the proverbial mask, mm-hmm. and be somebody else. Oh, that's really cool. Right? And now yeah. in many ways, like you, doing the speaking, the performing, whatever that is, it's a mask in a, in a, different, in a different form, way. in a different way. Yeah, yeah. but it's kind of neat, though, because I think that when you was first start performing, mm. it is, you're very much wearing that mask, and you're yes. very much poised. And I've seen you speak before, Mark, and you're very poised, and you you have, you know exactly what you're going to say. But mm. the cool thing is, I think, um, in a place like YouTube, or I mean, in the venues that you speak, you mm-hmm. can also get really vulnerable. So it's kind yeah. of like you're performing, but you're also sharing something. And I think that's where the right. real performing I, I think gets so going. Too. And, you know, Sometimes uh, I love the the art of public speaking just as a as a skill, uh, and like anything else, I think you have to learn the fundamentals. You have mm-hmm. to learn how to structure it. You have to learn how to do the right arc. How to how to end it on a good note, um, because people sharing their experience of li- of their lived experience of mental illness is one of the best ways to break down stigma. Yeah. Uh, but there's also, I think, a good way and a not so good way to do that. Mm-hmm. Right. If you're just going up on stage or in front of a camera and dumping all your trauma out on everybody oh, and expecting them to help you through it, then that's not going to work. Right? No. And, uh, or likewise in therapy, the whole idea of um, safe and effective use of self, what you're using your only what you're using your own stuff for, if it's yeah. for you or for somebody else. Absolutely. Um, so uh, so I like that. But once you once you learn the fundamentals and how to structure it, then you get to play. And yeah. that's where it becomes fun. Right. Definitely. On your YouTube. So I haven't been able to get into the YouTube thing. Apparently, I have a couple hundred followers on oh my, gosh, my account, okay. but Very I've never cool. actually posted it. Or actually, no, that's not true. I did post one video of me making a balloon dog okay. uh, that could, okay. to circle back to the clown thing. Really um, but, but a bunch of people just go on there and, and follow it, even okay. though I've never posted anything. Uh, and well, you have a very viral TED Talk, though, so I'm sure you get right. a lot of followers from that. Well, and that's probably 100% where they come from. Okay. It's, just, it's just runoff from the TED Talk. And I've always thought about um, using that opportunity, but I have all these, all my own anxieties about that really? too. Yeah, oh, that's so yeah. funny. Because well, I was going to ask you today if yeah. you were like thinking about maybe doing YouTube. And yeah. I think you'd be great. But at the same time, people always ask me, oh, are you going to write a book? Or are you going to do podcasts? And I'm like, no, 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 no. Because I think it's important to just go with right. what you want to do and not have anyone I think so you. too. And I, I feel like I would like it, but I'm also better on paper, I think. <laughs> 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 I just don't know, like how much do you edit and, and, and play with your talks before you actually, or your, your videos rather, before you publish them? Well, or do you just record and publish? Oh, no, there's a lot of stuff that goes into it now. Right. So I used to edit all my own videos, but now I have a team. So I have someone yeah. who edits. He's in Alaska. Oh, really? Yeah. But I mean, sending raw footage to an editor is also very nerve wracking, sure. right? Because you're like, oh, my God, what if I say something stupid? And they're gonna, <laughs> you know what I mean? You're just yeah. like, oh, this person's going to watch my raw footage. So that was like a, a kind of a hump to get over. But and I also have somebody that helps me with production now. So like mm-hmm. the pre-production and like setting things up just because I have a busy schedule sure. and it can take a while just to get everything like looking the way that I want it to. So okay. um, but you, you have a vision in your mind, though, of how it should look and sound. And do you, yeah. do you script them? Um, yeah, sometimes. Like, it really depends on what I want to say. Right. So I usually have some bullet points. And sometimes I just completely free flow. But then yep. the, the more I free, free flow, the more I have to, in the editing suite, if I'm editing a part of it or whatever, I really have to construct, like, the story arc right. of it. It's, it's, it's the same thing as public speaking. You know, yeah. there's a lot that you just don't put in. Yeah. And then a lot that you, you do decide little chunks and how you're going to arrange it and all that stuff. Because yeah. it has to be entertaining. Yeah. And it has to be something that's easy for people to watch. So. Well, this is it. So so how long are they typically? My bit? videos are roughly eight. To 10 minutes depending yeah. on the video uh, and the U- YouTube algorithm now is very savage so it, it, really? it won't like it if somebody doesn't watch a good percentage of your video oh so, so what it, does that mean what happens then so um, it will deep it will be deprioritized in the algorithm so if somebody watches a hundred percent of your video then that's the type of video that could go viral okay um, and if, it, if it's a very like attractive or controversial topic yeah. but if it's a video that people kind of click on and watch the first 20 seconds and then click away right. you won't get a lot of views on it so okay. it's so 
I try to make everything something that's um, that's entertaining and that I don't want to click away from. Something that's that's very um, uh, compelling. So, right. so right. if I have something and I if even if I go to the trouble of creating it and it's done, but I don't find that it like meets the quality of like what I want to put out there, yeah. I just won't publish it. Yeah, yeah. And have you noticed that? Uh, I'm sure you've done a lot of the analytics, but that time frame tends to to connect best with people. That that eight to ten minute kind of time frame. For or just me, shorter, better, longer, better. So for me, it does, and yeah. YouTube likes watch time. So in yeah. their algorithm, they prefer channels that get a lot of watch time. Okay. So like a thirty-minute episode versus like a three-minute episode. Right. Um, but I think it really depends on the creator and their content. Sure. Like my brother has a science channel, and their videos work best around three minutes. Okay. Um, Your brother has a very popular science channel, so you don't yeah. downplay it. Right? <laughs> um, ASAP Science. That's is, right. is yeah. Extremely popular. Yeah. yeah, and so for them, I mean, when YouTube announced their algorithm was changing, it's not like they're going to go and make thirty minute videos now right. because I mean first of all that would take like years to produce their sure. channel yeah, yeah. Uh, but three minutes really works well for a simple scientific concept so for right. them they were like nope we're just keeping our content the same and yeah. and that's how we're gonna do it so, okay. Okay. so I think it's about knowing what works best for you and your audience yeah. so you could play if you were gonna start a channel you could just go on and play around and do a few videos that that you liked and I think that's the key is sure. you have to be proud of it and sure. you know something that you're passionate about and then just see what happens not a lot of people realize how much control is involved in this kind of thing too, you know, behind the scenes. And when I think of uh, the public speaking stuff that I'm doing, or even this podcasting, you know, I know where my mic is right now. I know where the yeah. like, when I'm on stage. <laughs> I know where my lights are. I know where the sound guy is. I know where every. I know how the audience is going to laugh at certain things that I say and not at certain things that. For you sure. Know. So there's a lot of. Um, you know, for as much as you play in parts of it. And, and I think that's where I'd have to get more comfortable with the YouTube piece is really yeah. that this is something new. And I, I you know, um, it, it'll take practice like anything 100%. else. 100%. You know? Yeah. And I, I think that that's what holds people back from doing a lot of new things. For <laughs> think, sure. Right? The fear of failure. Fear or, of failure. The fear of the unknown. Or not looking good, especially if you have an established presence somewhere right. else. I mean, for me, I was doing so much TV when I started YouTube and people were like, well, why would you do YouTube when you can go on TV? Like, right. why would you even? But for me, it was it was something I saw potential in and yeah. my first video was really horrible like it was just what was it what was your first oh my god I think I did um I had just done a tv segment on this phenomenon called a thigh gap I feel like this oh, was like a yes, really popular trend yeah. and I was mad about it because I was like sure. this is something that like I don't even know why this is a trend this is ridiculous mm -hmm. and so I went on my channel and I was like um, I was basically just talking about why this is like really stupid and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> something yep. and so and why, why it was kind of unhealthy to think in that sure. way and so um, but it was in my office and it was really crappy quality you could, the sound was really bad and then I just kind of edited it together and threw it up yeah. um, but I think just getting something up there yeah. is really scary but Every single week when you do it, you'll get better and better. And sure. and that's the idea. Is it's just little tweaks every well, week. Well, if, if you need a mentee on YouTube stuff, then I'm, <laughs> I'm willing to learn. Oh, my God. I'm totally that. down. Yeah. I, I could talk about YouTube all day. It's yeah, so yeah, much fun. Yeah. 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 Um, so, uh, you know, you've, you've been in uh, doing media things for a while, traditional media and, yeah. and uh, new media as well. Um, you mentioned the, the thigh gap. How many of these trends have you seen come along over the years? Oh, my gosh. So many. Yeah. And, and so often many. it's like, like they find three is a trend in media. For those who don't know, they find three kids who are doing this weird thing and then suddenly it's sweeping the nation. Right? Exactly. Gosh. So, what are, was, uh, so, so you must have commented on a lot of these types of things over the years. Yeah, certainly. And I think a lot of them are just... Um, kind of designed to make people freak out right. and so right. um, so I get a lot of questions on my channel even in my DMs about um, kind of trending things like this or, or whether it's like a celebrity or some kind of surgery that's really sure. popular yeah. and um, and I, but I think those types of things are really can can really on top of all of the other things that teen girls go through can yeah. really add to the stress sure. and so I think that it's part of my job to kind of say okay this is like not important at all well and especially <laughs> since that stress is being constructed for for people it doesn't actually exist it's not a thing really yeah right? exactly it's just being given to you so what's what's trendy now what are, what are people anxious about now what are people <laughs> anxious about oh my gosh um well i'm thinking okay so um what is really popular um okay so really popular right now is a new app called tiktok I don't. I have TikTok? not even heard of this. It's it's sweeping the nation. I find as I get older, the less and less I've heard about things. <laughs> <laughs> like, 
I still find Snapchat stupid, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, I don't think anyone's on Snapchat anymore. Yeah. Oh, really? But, oh, no, okay. no, it's well, there completely we go. dead there we now. Go. Yeah. So, but TikTok is like, okay, if you've ever heard of an app called Musical.ly, Musical.ly was very popular and was bought by TikTok, a mm. Japanese company. And now um, this is kind of like the new place where young people are spending all their time. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's even like that kind of culture is now filtrating into YouTube as well. Mm. Um, the, the problem with TikTok, and so I actually did a video all about TikTok and trying to going on the platform and actually doing TikTok videos. Mm. Um, The problem with it is that it's very superficial and the clips are only 15 seconds. So you become a follower of someone without really knowing them. And it's all based on looks and kind of superficial. That was like the Vine thing, too. That died, too, didn't it? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a so it's a bit of a a tough place for young people to be spending a lot of time because they're not really getting advice or education it's really just kind of seeing these other people in a very superficial way right. and i have a feeling i mean there's no studies done on it sure. yet but i have a feeling it could really lead to some low self-esteem or some it, it's a sketchy place if you have kids sure. and they're on tiktok i would say probably you want to limit the time that they spend on yeah it. for sure so what can people possibly say in 15 seconds it takes me 15 seconds to try to think of what i'm gonna say not let yeah. alone say it so. so this is the problem with tiktok is that you're not even saying anything you're actually just right. lip syncing to uh, a song okay i got you so it's kind of fun because there's a musical component sure. component, and that's why I like well, I enjoyed going on TikTok and making some videos but then um, there's also this aspect of you're not really saying anything right. and you're not really following people because you want to hear what they have to say you're following them because it's entertaining and, and those sure. people are attractive or so there, there's ver- it's very it's a very superficial place to be spending sure. time well, and so. I imagine it's that little dopamine hit or whatever it is that you get when you see something you enjoy pleasurable attractive whatever and then it's gone. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so if you're posting videos on TikTok, it can be really addicting or addictive sure. for kids, I think, um, to say, wow, I'm getting all this attention. And all I did was put up a 15 second clip right. of me lip syncing. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it doesn't really re- I mean, anyone can do it. It doesn't really require any kind of like barrier to entry. Right. So. Um, so I think TikTok. that's why that's the, you should well, so, check it out. So how, no, I won't. <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't want to check it out. Uh, and it'll be over by the time I, I download it, I'm sure, anyway. So, okay, so TikTok. So that, so that's, that's the latest, greatest app that that's everyone's the latest, on. That's the latest, greatest app, okay. Um, Hinge is the new dating app. I don't know if any if I have not even, I don't use a lot. I don't use any dating apps anyway, so <laughs> I'm not familiar. What's it's Hinge? actually really funny. So Hinge... Um, I've worked with some clients who are using Hinge, but also I, I recently we're doing this new series on my channel where I work with people individually on their relationships. I mm-hmm. kind of go to them and work with them um, to kind of help them in whatever way they need. So whether we go out in public and talk to people or we go on a dating app and help their profile or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so I was working with a friend of mine, Rachel David, who's also kind of like a, a YouTuber and kind of public figure. And she um, was <laughs> was looking to date. And, and so I set up a profile for her. And okay. Hinge is apparently like the new place where everyone's meeting okay um it took me a while to figure this out because i was on tinder and a bunch of other apps for her and i i wasn't finding people that actually met the criteria that she'd given me <laughs> I was like, she's really specific i guess like apparently she's a very yeah. high profile person and she, she's like they have to be this this and this and sure this. and i was like oh my gosh okay so i was feeling very overwhelmed and then i asked my husband oh my gosh like what are the apps and so he asked around at work <laughs> he works at salesforce which is like a whole bunch of uh young kind of sure. competitive guys and he's like oh hinge is where it's at okay so so i went on hinge and all of the people were meeting her criteria so i thought okay this is interesting so i so i guess there's a lot of um a lot of new people that are kind of on hinge and um it's it's a little bit different than a typical dating app because you really have to say more about yourself it's not just pictures but you have to say kind of interesting things about your life and then they highlight that on your profile preferably true things True right. things, but, yeah, but yeah. funny things as well, sure. and they kind of they kind of edit it together to make this really neat little profile that you can scroll down. And okay, so, so what you get are a sense of a person? Uh, so doing this kind of work, what are people? What did you find that people are looking for? What are you know? I assume they're they're diverse, but how do you help somebody construct a profile for a dating app? Gosh, well, I mean, dating apps are very tough, but I mm-hmm. think that. Um, the problem that most people fall into on dating apps is actually that they spend too much time talking to people before they actually meet in person, mm. which is a huge waste oh, of time yeah. because you're not going to know if you have chemistry with someone until you meet them. I mean, period. Right. So what I mean, happens rule out is, if they're going to like kill you and then yeah. you're, you're probably good. Everything after that's probably fine. Yeah, well, fine. you can still meet in a public place like a Starbucks <laughs> or something and go on a two minute date and be like, okay, right. this isn't working this isn't out. Work. Yeah, but yeah. at least meet them because a lot of people will spend like six months and they'll be like, it's my soulmate. Right. And then like they meet 
and they're like, okay, yeah, like this isn't going to happen. Right. Well, because it's not a real so, relationship if you're just texting back and forth. It's really right? not, yeah. right? And the, you just cannot understand if you're compatible physically with someone and, and even emotionally if you just don't spend time with them in person. Yeah. So um, I met my husband the traditional way, which was in a bar. <laughs> <laughs> fair, okay, fair enough. Which was pretty yeah. funny because I think at that time, I was pretty young actually. It was like maybe 12 years ago now. I was in my master's and I, you know, I kind of looked around and he approached me, but it was like, and in, in those days you could kind of look around and like see who you find attractive or mm-hmm. you kind of know immediately when you see someone and you're like, okay, I think I could get along with that person. Uh, but online dating is so different because right. you really cannot get a sense of someone just from a photo. I don't right. think. Well, I'm not, not familiar with the statistics or if there's really any much research at all on on uh, how on the staying power of social media relationships and, and if these kinds of connections actually last. Well, they do. Oh, they do. They do. But you just have to get out there and meet enough people. Right, right. And people get really frustrated when they've met three people and like, oh, I haven't found the sure, one yet. And I'm like, yeah. no, no, no. Like, you really have to keep trying and go on like 20 dates because... Yeah. Like when you see that person or when you're with that person that you actually have a connection with, you're going to know. I tell people that about therapists, too, actually, by the <laughs> <Yeah>. way. <laughs> Don't you just because you have one bad or, or underwhelming experience with a therapist, maybe it just didn't work. Maybe it just didn't connect. Go out and date a bunch and fit see who everything. you like. Yeah, 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 fit is everything. Yeah, fit is everything. So I totally agree with you. So then uh, once you start to get to know that person, how do you, how does your marriage work? What do, what do you do to make it work? <laughs> oh, you mean like once you're... Yeah. I, what, what, what's important in these relationships that make them work? Oh, my gosh. Well, I mean, in, I think in any relationship is making that person feel important mm-hmm. um, because they are. They're a big part of your life. Um, so with us, what we do, I mean, obviously, we have a child and another one on the way. We're really busy, um, but we always make time for each other. So yeah. we set aside one night every other every other week where we have our nanny stay and we go on a date. Nice. So I'll plan it or he'll plan it. And, um, and we just went on a nice little weekend away to New York for my birthday. So like there's little things like that that we do that we make sure we're putting the time into each other and it doesn't take a lot of work (laughs) not at all you know it can be inconvenient to to schedule something but then it's you're so glad that you did it because i think a lot of couples really get lost in the kind of day-to-day and and it's life is busy we all know like we've, we've got jobs we've got kids and and it can be really hard to say you know what we actually need to work on this as a relationship too whether right. whether or not it's going well or it's not going well this is something that we have to put time into because right. um otherwise it will it will not be successful sure. so so what what do you think kills most relationships uh there's a number of things that can kill relationships but i think the number one thing is prioritizing mm-hmm. one another and the mm-hmm. relationship so th- saying things like oh well you know i don't have enough time to to really talk to you, to sit down and have a conversation or to set goals. Mm-hmm. And that's not, I don't think anyone ever consciously says that, sure. but I think um, it can happen because of, as a result of just life happening. Yeah. Um, so I think if, you know, if there are couples out there and you're feeling like you want to work on your relationship or you need work, a lot of the time it's just a matter of saying, okay, what can we, like, what kind of questions can I ask you that really help me understand where you're at right now that make right. you feel important and that help you understand that I'm invested in the relationship right. still? And is that the kind of work you're, you're not practicing anymore, but your teams uh, throughout the city, is that the kind of work they're doing in marriage and, and family therapy? Yeah, a lot of the time, yes. So a lot of them are trained in kind of um, traditional marriage and family therapy, um, but sex therapy is another big thing as well. Mm-hmm. Some couples have a lot of trouble connecting, so that can be individual or couples therapy. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and so I, I'd say like for the most part, we the practice is really like at the heart of it is relationships, but we work with mm-hmm. a lot of other general issues right. as well. One of the... Uh, my favorite things that I think marriage has taught me so far is uh, how many eccentricities I have. That, <laughs> that some, and you can change. I can change a lot of them. I try hard. But then part of it is just willing to accept, look, <laughs> I'm not going to be perfect and neither are you. And that's OK. We're two yeah, imperfect people. Of course. People. Yeah, yeah, of course. That's part of it. Right. And yeah. and I think if you find a partner who loves your eccentricities, that's even better. <laughs> so someone Well, love that- is a strong word for eccentricities. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I mean, but like uh, someone who it bothers less than it might bother right. someone else. Um, Do you find this in? Uh, have you seen this in the social media dating piece where um, you know everything is so constructed, so intentional? You, uh, I saw a study before that if you wear a red shirt in your Tinder profile, you're going to get more clicks or something yeah, like that. Yeah. yeah, is that actually true? By the way, that's true. Is it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So. <laughs> 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 but you know everything is so intentional. 
you're not posting those awkward moments where somebody said, uh, you know, something and you answered inappropriately or, or said the wrong thing or did a weird thing or, you yeah. know, you're not posting all your weird things about yourself. No, does that but surprise you're gonna... more people? Yeah, it does. But the thing is, like, whether or not you meet on social media, you're going right. to face all these issues eventually sure, anyway. Sure. So I'm not against social media, like meeting over social media no. or Tinder or whatever app you're using. Right. Because the truth is, like, it's all going to come out anyway. It's just um, it's just a matter of, like, how to find those people sure. that you would date. Once you start to get to know them. But is there a, a generational difference? Uh, I, I think I qualify as an old millennial. Uh, <laughs> according to the yeah, 1982. So, which, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that makes me that, and it's like makes me feel even older than it actually is <laughs> to call it anyway. And, <laughs> right. <laughs> anyway, um, I forget what I was just going to say. Oh, oh, uh, but a generational uh, a change where are people looking more for that uh, immediate gratification now than people used to? Like you know, sometimes people would stay married, often detrimentally yes regardless of any circumstance but now it seems more immediate yeah i think there is an aspect of that especially because um in you know in dating and relationships you're gonna have people that would have done that anyways way back in the day that are kind of like the player or someone who doesn't want to settle down but um unfortunately for those people it's just way easier for them to do that now Mm. um kind of exploiting these this technology that's now at their fingertips Mm. um so i think you do have to be careful when you're on social media and make sure that um, uh, you know, I, I think it's um, just evaluating the people that you're going on dates sure, with and making sure, sure that um, you feel that connection with them. Um, I'm a, an introvert. Um, that often surprises people who don't really know me. But part of being an introvert is that you have a lot of associates and only a few close friends. Yeah. So a lot of the like a lot of my well. associates think that I'm an extrovert, but my close friends know. Yeah, we got to leave him alone. He needs some yeah. alone time. <laughs> <That's nice. laughs> uh, yeah. But, you know, I imagine that must be really hard for people that it's so easy to have hundreds of associates now who don't really know anything about you. Yeah. But it seems to be getting harder and harder to make close friends. Yeah. And I'd say that's the same with some of my subscribers and followers Mm. on social media is that I think this is the generation that young kids are growing up in right Right. now, which is it's I think that is one of the big challenges. I mean, you're not you're not joining the army or whatever with a bunch of people and building lifelong relationships. You're you're casually encountering people. Yeah. There's so much more of this kind of superficial relationship so mm. even if you have a best friend or, or and you're texting back and forth there's a lot more communication but it seems to be like less deep less communication. Quality. yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, so I think that real in-person relationships are really important for young people and mm. for everyone yeah. <laughs> um, but and, and making sure you're limiting screen time because ultimately mm. screen time is what leads you to kind of these superficial and I'm guilty of that too even sure. on Instagram responding to people and and friends and stuff making comments but well, you're you not, exist m- professionally on a screen right? 100 <laughs> so so limit so, your other screen time not the ask kimberly <laughs> screen yeah time. well if yeah. it's what you do for a living um you know but no you, no i mean in terms of watchers sorry they should still watch you even, oh. if they're li- even if they're limiting they should still watch you well i think you can watch the things that are important to you but yeah. know when to turn it off and know when to sure. say okay now i'm going to focus on the people i love right. <laughs> so because I, I hear so many couples that say oh you know we spend so much time together but we're literally both in our phones right. or we're on our ipads until we go to bed and it's so sad to see that you could have such a quality relationship die because of technology or right. because there's just not enough attention paid. Yeah, so. two people sitting next to each other on their phones and there's no connection at all between them. Yes. Versus, you know, in a weird kind of way, once you get to a certain level in a in a secure relationship, you can sit next to somebody and watch a movie or both reading books or something sure. and you still feel very connected. Yes. <laughs> but there's something about the screen, about the phone that seems to sever that. Yeah, it can be very distracting for people, I think, a lot of the time. So right. um, it and, and I've read some literature as well on like parenting, like parents who use their phones too I've much that, around their yeah. kids. Like it can make the kid feel like they're not a very big priority. Right. And I think I think that can be really detrimental sure. to any relationship. Well, and it seems, I, I think, you know, in some of that research to make the uh, parent more impatient as well. Mm-hmm. Partly, I think, because if your attention's on one thing and it's being pulled away, as kids will do <laughs> or partners or anybody like else. A million times a day. <laughs> a million times a day. But that, that irritates people because they're they're being their attention is being moved around. Yeah. Yeah. I feel irritable when I'm on Facebook too much or, or Twitter. Yeah, me yeah. as well. So I think that's like that's something that I think we all need to kind of be mindful of. I have a feeling like in 10 years there's going to be so much research on social media and phones sure. that I think that there will be like mental health days where people just don't use their phone. Like maybe I, yeah. every Sunday. I do. Or... I, I do it for sure. Yeah. Actually, <laughs> I'd be I, so up for that. If no, I do. When no one's using social there's, media. Um, I don't know if you've heard about it, but there's an adult um, summer camp uh, that's a digital detox of sorts. And those are becoming oh, a lot 
know. Yeah. Well. yeah. I, I think I know somebody that goes to that camp. Apparently it's a lot of fun because it's <laughs> yeah. like, it's just stuff with, you know, f- phones and, and even the internet came out while we were alive. Yeah. <laughs> it's an old, an old millennial thing. Yep. Um, but we remember a time before these. We do. It sounds like such an old fogey conversation <laughs> right now. <laughs> Where you have to, have to go knock on somebody's door and yeah. say hello. Or, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So what's next for you uh, in terms of, of what you're creating, what you're working on? You know, you, you're, you're focusing on being a YouTuber now. So yeah. what's next? Yeah. Well, I have a lot of things that I kind of want to do. This is the year I promised myself that 2019 would be the year that I do all the things I'm afraid to do. Mm. So um, for me, that really involves being a lot more vulnerable. I feel sure. like I've kind of come a long way on YouTube and in my practice and stuff. But this year I'm going to go even farther. And so I'm what just are you gonna... afraid of? Well, I think the the thing that I've been the most afraid of is sharing personal information because it's always been really? in a professional context. So, so you nodded politely when I said about the stages being about control and knowing where everything is, but then you didn't actually say, <laughs> no, no, I do the same. <laughs> I tell people what I want people to know, <laughs> right? Well, I think we... I we, think all we all do. do no, we, I... don't. we all do. That's not a criticism at all. That's, that's yeah, I do that. <laughs> that's, yeah. That's why, in some ways, why we do this, that, that it feels safe, that we know what we're Definitely. doing. Definitely. Right? And so, like, just before the holiday, like, just in the last few weeks, I've told a couple stories on YouTube that were very personal. So one of them was um, the experience that I had giving birth to my daughter, which was very traumatic. Actually, it was the right. first really traumatic experience I've ever had. Yeah. Um, so I told a little bit about that story. And, um, and then, actually, last week, <laughs> this is kind of funny. I recreated Cardi B's maternity photos and they're all actually <laughs> nudes so that and I put but you can't see anything on YouTube it's not like super racy or anything like yeah, that yeah. but it was but it was something that so that was super creative that was something that was completely out of my comfort sure. zone but I just said okay let's go for it and let's do it because my, yeah. my audience chose Cardi B yeah. <laughs> I thought they were gonna choose like Shakira or something and I was right. like oh, that'll be fine but Cardi B is like extremely racy and I was hey, like you gotta give the oh. audience what they want right <laughs> like, oh my god <laughs> <laughs> this is not like me to do this at all but but I I think that I'm just kind of willing to say, okay, I, I surrender and I'm just going to um, just be a part of the audience and and let myself look stupid at times right. or, or vulnerable and share my own stories because I think that yeah. really is part of um, the culture, but also um, people understand that you can be a professional and be a human at the right. same time. Well, and also I, I really respond to this idea of um, not avoiding things because they're uncomfortable, but all my life when I reflect on it, when I feel discomfort, it's an it's an urge to run into it. Mm-hmm. That, that that's an indicator that there's something there that I want to explore and that it's yeah. interesting. Right? Yeah, and, and, But that seems to be. I mean, phobias and fears and OCD. It's it's the exact opposite. The things <laughs> yeah. are you're afraid of, so you run away from them, right? Yeah. But ultimately, like so for me, I find some of those videos, like the ones where I really share my personal stories, are the ones that 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 people react to sure. the most. And it, it might even be something like I shared a story about an abusive boyfriend that I had growing mm. up, and um, and that was a really scary time for me but um but the responses that I got from subscribers were just so powerful it was sure. like well now I know like I'm gonna know what the signs are yeah yeah so well, that's real life right yeah. it's, it's not everything isn't about um you know how to know if a, if a boy likes you is part of life but mm-hmm. that's not all of life it's there's also that boy life. that likes you in the wrong way or, or whatever it is for you know? sure well, that, so. that, that's good. That I'm, I'm glad that you're able to take your platform and connect with people in that way and give them some yeah. useful information. Thank you so much. Yeah. What would you tell somebody, especially a young person, a young girl uh, in particular, uh, who's really struggling right now? Gosh, well, um, well, I can definitely relate. And I think that a lot of us um, can probably put ourselves in your shoes. And life as a girl does get better as you get older and as you learn and as you form new relationships and and learn more about yourself and I think it's not always comfortable in the moment and if you're struggling I would just say hang in there and try to find people around you that you care about who you love and who can help you it's really tough and it's not like anyone's saying it isn't tough because it is <laughs> the, thank you so much yeah uh, thank you Dr. Kimberly Moffat PhD level uh, not allowed to call herself a psychologist but really is <laughs> in every sense of the term thank you so much for thank you so in. much for having me All right, that's my conversation with Kimberly Moffat, psychotherapist, relationship expert, YouTuber. Uh, you can find Kim on YouTube. Uh, you can you can follow her hashtag as well. Ask Kimberly for all your relationship questions. What, please watch her videos. They're they're really interesting. Uh, and I was so glad that we were able to talk about things like relationships and her work in that space. Don't forget to follow me as well on Twitter and and uh, Facebook at Mark Hennick, at M A R K H E N I C K. Don't forget one N. 
And don't forget to go on the website too, markhennick.com slash so-called normal. Uh, that's it for now. Please subscribe to the show, rate it. Uh, this has been such an amazing experience so far, all these people that we've been talking to. And we have so many more really exciting guests coming up every single week uh, on so-called normal. So tune in. We'll talk to you again next time. Thank you.